I went to college, I was very much a city boy. Um, I chose to study environmental sciences because I was very attracted to the idea of making a sustainable world. Um, and I was very much intrigued by questions of um, planetary boundaries, so uh, climate change, the erosion of soils, um, overfishing, deforestation, etc. I chose to study environmental sciences. What I didn't really find so interesting uh, was farming and soils, uh, like soil acidification, etc. That was, for me, a stretch too far away. So I was really intrigued more by the big picture of big sustainability. Um, I went therefore to study environmental sciences, but guess what? I ended up finishing my bachelor's thesis uh, with a thesis on farmland fauna. Oh, this one is actually one behind. Um, farmland fauna. Okay, you now I understand how to read the screen. Um, Farmland was a topic for me, it was super interesting at a certain point in time when I went through my studies. So here you see four beautiful little birds, um, uh, like the lapwing and, um, well, I can't remember, the, the partridge is there as well. And I studied the, their ecology and their fauna. And then when I finished my university master's degree, I did actually a very hands-on uh, study of the soils. So actually some of those soils you see here received a manure treatment. Like, so I kind of tilted from being a very city boy to somebody who appreciated the land and agriculture. I also started to appreciate uh, the social life of farmers. Because it's not just about uh, if we take care of the soil and plants, but it's really also if people know how to engage with soils, etc. So uh, these pictures I took um, a couple of years ago when I visited the beautiful Swiss village of Turbel. And Turbel is um, pretty well known in certain circles. Turbel has managed to succeed for a very long time uh, to keep their sparse rainfall, uh, but distributed over <coughs> many farms in the So this is the Valais region of Switzerland, and in the summer it has very low precipitation, it rains not so much, but there is snow melt. And the farmers have already in 1483 uh, established a, uh, a statute and a, a commons organization uh, with which they distributed that scarce snow melt among themselves. So they were uh, gardeners and they were pastoralists. Um, and in the village, they actually also started to uh, keep records. So for 400 years, they kept records of how they actually distributed it, uh, who got to be the policeman, who got to be the, the chairman of the board, really. Um, so these are really age-old institutions that they managed to build and secure those commons, the land that they held in, uh, collaboratively. Next thing, I find myself back at the city. So by now I work at Bach, which is a creative research institution that focuses on technology and society. And we very much work with uh, citizens and urban governments. What we also do is programming, so we're programmers, we're designers. Uh, we love to build open knowledge. So we're also working for digital governments. And um, the big question might now be, so what is kind of the, the common thread between those different uh, interests? Well, it's the complexity. If there is one common denominator between those different uh, topics that I mentioned, it can be the planetary systems, uh, management of the soil, farmlands, but also taking care of urban commons and the digital uh, knowledge that we share. It is dealing with complexity. And I want to uh, explain why it is. Um, to give a little bit of more authority to the argument, uh, I bring in Stephen Hawking. He said, actually, um, that I think the next century will be the century of complexity. So why did he think so? Complexity is a very big theme, and one way of looking at it is by looking at the success, succession of societal structure. So what you see here is a, a timeline uh, which demonstrates uh, the former societies of old, uh, going back uh, 10,000 years ago, a hunter-gatherer society, which was then succeeded by agricultural societies, uh, and now we live in industrial or even post-industrial societies. Not every one of us, because still, 
uh, a large part of the world is living uh, predominantly with agricultural systems, but industrialization is happening everywhere. But of course, complexity <coughs> is not just a theme within society, it's also certainly um, a, a natural phenomenon in ecology. So this is a, a picture of uh, a soil food map, and it's really a simplified uh, scheme that says who eats who. So in the soil there's all kinds of creatures burrowing through the soil and walking on it and, and, and eating each other. And with this complexity um, they, they can maintain their, their ecosystem, they can really withstand all kinds of challenges. Um, for example, uh, they, have to, uh, they can experience pest uh, animals, but also uh, climate phenomena, weather patterns that start shifting. So we really need the diversity, we need this complexity uh, in nature also for ourselves to, to persist. But there is a catch. It turns out that we manage to build one type of complexity, the societal and economic complexity, at the loss of natural complexity, ecological. So I give you here just three examples um, which are about standardization. So the first is standardized weights. At a certain point in time, all those different weight systems, but also in length and temperature and other measures, uh, were so wild and abundant that it was an impediment to trade. And then, uh, from science, but also uh, trade boards, they, they, there was a, a drive to standardize all of these. So here you can see the standard kilo, which is maintained in Paris and also 50 other locations in the world. In the middle, you see uh, a chamber of commerce picture. So chambers of commerce, which were also instituted, some of them 300 years ago, really helped uh, to bring about more facilitated ways of trading with each other internationally. So where international trade used to be kind of uh, a, a, a conduct of, uh, of, of sometimes even warfare, but at least ceremony, but now it's, it's super standard. So it's really an economical routine to do international trade, to pay with your bank cards, etc. It was facilitated by as well, standardization. And the last you see here is standardization of forestry. And not just in forestry, but also in uh, agriculture at large. So forestry used to be that you walked into a forest and you just looked if there was any tree that you liked. Uh, but there was a super wild diversity of trees and of all kinds of different ages. And then they succeeded in, uh, row, in planting rows of trees of one uh, single species and one age group which certainly facilitated also bulk trade. So, um, complexity of society and economy uh, is what we achieved, but it's not just a pure good thing. In this famous book, Joseph Tainter described uh, notoriously how, amongst others, the Roman Empire succumbed under its own weight uh, in uh, yeah, a couple of centuries in the in Christian era. Um, they couldn't really keep up with the bureaucratic and administrative and also uh, martial demands that need, was needed to cover the whole of the enormous Roman terrain. And they just crumbled and fell apart. It was, has become too big. And perhaps what you can, could have seen in the global financial crunch is another token of the, our complexity if the economy might have become too big. And currently we are also experiencing uh, political instability as a result. So interestingly, I think you can conclude there are two types of complexity. The one is vertical complexity and the other is horizontal complexity. And they're both really diff uh, different. <coughs> and the double trouble now is that we actually succeeded in <coughs> enlarging the societal complexity, which is risky, as data showed, but at the expense of natural quality and complexity. We have really eroded much of the biodiversity. Uh, the sixth extinction is going on. Lots of flies and bees and, and, and wasps uh, are dying. The soil fauna has been deteriorated. Um, so we need to find other ways of navigating and balancing those different types of complexity. I think actually that this movement that you might be familiar with, the Yellow Fest, is also a case in point. Um, <coughs> the funny thing is that at the same day there were Yellow Fests at the one uh, corner of, of Paris demonstrating against 
environmental taxes and regulation, but other groups with the same vest <coughs> wanting more environmental regulation because they thought that those capitalists were just ruining the climate system. So uh, these groups are being uh, explained as being super polarized and they don't know what, you know what they are themselves, but I think it's really two sides of the same coin. It's both types of protest against a society that has become super complex and unfair in a way it, it distributes burdens, uh, but also we can witness that the complexity of what we really value, such as natural but also maybe cultural and linguistic quality, um, has been deteriorating. So my question then is how can we navigate that question of complexity better? And for me, this idea of commons is very interesting. Because I started with this planet, the global commons. But the global commons is really super big, and no, no one of us really feels an agency when it comes to saving the climate on this big a scale. So that's why actually commons just doesn't mean the whole planet and the climate. Let me give you this definition. It says commons uh, are shared resources, um, managed and maintained by community on the basis of mutually agreed and enforced <coughs> rules. So it's really important to look at the, there being a resource, a community and rules. And actually the community, that could be all of us in this room, uh, really have tools to start talking with each other to how to regulate our common behavior with those resources. Giving you an example, this is my, uh, my food cooperative in Amsterdam, where we're distributing uh, veggies on the pickup day um, amongst each other and we're all kind of volunteering to do that. And we do this in collaboration with the farmers on the other end of the chain. And together as consumers and, and farmers, we form a kind of a commons. Because what is the essence here? Uh, we don't only look at uh, price, at exchange value, but we look at so many more values. So for us it's important that we also have uh, a conversation about what is the values that we care for. Are we paying enough for the farmers? Are they really protecting their soils? Well, they are, they, because they're very good organic farmers. But we get to learn from them as well how, what problems they face. If they, they, they are challenged by changing weather patterns, or if they have a very low harvest, or excessively rich harvest, where they have to kind of give away food for free, and we try to see if we can help them out. These types of initiatives are notoriously difficult to assess and understand. Uh, because we got very used to standardized measures and standardized ideas of what is transaction, so it's really money, it's monetized value. So in order to try to get a better understanding, we launched the Chamber of Commons. And with this chamber we try to give more language and give more visibility to those initiatives and to find out what their needs are and how we can help them uh, bring about the right type of complexity and not build those high towers of structures that become looming above our heads, but really more of the, of the relational network quality. Um, from Laag we look at technology, that's a super important uh, facilitating aspect. However, there's also a potential risk in technology. So what I present here is the Earth Bank of Codes, and this is just one of the initiatives that proposes, you could say shorthand, a blockchain-like solution to manage complexity. And on the one hand, it is, uh, I think, a well-attended attempt to make sure that we can really look at what are the different ecological components. But then I'm afraid that actually this kind of system, relying on a single huge uh, structure of measurement, again, and to the wrong type of complexity. So building yet more of the vertical type, uh, whereas actually it's really the, uh, the value and, and conversational qualities that we're looking so this is an important motto, this is the motto of the hacker movement. It says, if you can't open it, you don't own it. So ownership is really one of the core qualities of commons. If you want to reprogram the global commons, if you really want to have, you know, have a different kind of code behind how we actually deal with stuff from ranging from the climate to the soil, we need to be owners of the code. We need to write it ourselves and not get too much confused by difficult technological systems. So, I'm all for protecting the comments. I hope you want to join with this. I hope you want to code with us. Um, technology will be a super important facilitator, but let's not go bananas on it and build a super big structure. 
because I hardly think that this is the food map you had in mind for 21st century. Thank you for your attention.